Hey guys and welcome back. We've left Willow Springs in the rearview mirror and we're forging westward along Route 66. In 1995, a much younger man, I decided to take my Corvette and drive the entire Route 66 from just outside of Chicago all the way to the pier in Santa Monica. If you've ever traveled along Route 66, I'm sure you know that some of it's missing, replaced by the interstate and some sections are not fit for travel even more so today than it was in 1995. But, hey, that was almost 30 years ago. Strange, but I can't even remember where some of these photos were taken. And in 2008 or 9, I bought a Rolls Royce to restore, drove it back on Route 66 from California. It's nice to be young enough to make mistakes, isn't it? This time, though, Jill and I, we just want to meander along old 66 and see some selected sites. We originally had everything planned, but thanks to our electrical problems, now we are guided more by warmer weather than anything else and just having a good time. Jill is navigating by iPhone. She doesn't like the paper maps and the atlases that I do because the blue dot doesn't seem to update quick enough. Listen, I tried to explain it to him like this. By the time I figure out where we are, we aren't there anymore. Anyway, I think it was near Miami, Oklahoma, that we stopped at the welcome or rest area to get some information and take a few pictures. Jill browsed through the gift shop. We grabbed a bite to eat and then back on Interstate 44, Route 66, and headed for El Reno, just outside of Oklahoma City, to find a place to park for the night. We lucked up on an old KOA, clean, convenient, and they had night registration, which made things nice and easy. One stop along the way was the Route 66 Museum in Clinton, Oklahoma. Big rig, easy parking, and the entry fee was only $7 per person. Less than a hamburger. Although not a big museum, it was definitely worth the price of admission, as they say. There's some neat teasers outside to view, like this concrete mixer. The sign says this concrete mixer was used and owned by the Oklahoma Department of Transportation during construction of Route 66. Route 66, though, wasn't necessarily built as a new road, but mostly acquired or improved existing streets and roads, either dirt, gravel, or brick, or by covering with concrete. A couple of other items that I liked about this museum was the display of project markers which tied the FAP, or the Federal Aid Project, and the road section to a particular vendor or contractor. You can still use the Oklahoma Department of Transportation to research these markers when you find them. A link is in the description below. In addition to those project markers, there's also this right-of-way marker. The plans show these markers are to be placed about every quarter mile to delineate private property from the public roadways as Back in the 1920s, there were very few fences along the road. When you enter the lobby, you're greeted by an old Wurlitzer, Mustang, and a Coca-Cola cooler, among some other neat Route 66 memorabilia. Though immediately when we entered, we were contacted by an employee who evidently liked my camera and equipment and asked if we were professional photographers or with a magazine. We explained no but still, I provided my name and contact information. I realize this is a private museum and certainly have no problem with anyone protecting their investments and rights, their livelihood, etc. But I do wish they would provide a posted photography guidelines or rules, as these requirements vary so widely. This old Phillips 66 gas pump has a price of 49 cents and two tenths. Haven't seen those prices around since maybe the early 70s. And have you ever wondered why the gas is priced with tenths of a cent? Well, during the Great Depression of the 30s, most cars didn't have gas gauges. And as always, the government needed money. So they implemented a temporary gasoline tax, which miraculously has survived almost a hundred years. Gas at that time cost about 20 cents a gallon which in 2020 dollars, that's about three bucks a gallon. A penny tax was hefty at that time, about 15 cents in today's dollars. If you didn't have a gas gauge, 
Filling the tank with more gas than you had money, especially during the Great Depression, well, that could be a problem. There was also this neat wall of exampled old postcards from Route 66's glory days. In the 20s and 30s, phones were rare, and a long-distance call required an operator. Many times it even had to be scheduled and could be very expensive. For example, this excerpt from the 1920 New York City telephone directory shows the price of calls to various locations. Column 1 is for the first three minutes, and column 2 is for each minute thereafter. For example, to call Louisville, Kentucky from New York, it was $4.20 for the first three minutes. To call L.A. was almost $16 for the first three minutes. That's about $240 in today's money. Long distance calls, they used to be quite a thing. But, boy, have things changed. This map shows the start of Route 66 in Chicago and the end or the terminus at the Santa Monica Pier in California. This would have been quite the trip in the 1920s. And then this old thing. It really brought back some old memories that I had even forgotten about. It's a smudge pot. The great, great granddaddy of the orange barrels and the orange strobe lamps on barricades. These were filled with an oil and burned as kerosene lanterns to warn motorists of construction, road edges, or broken down vehicles. I can remember these as a kid. And check out these old photos. One I particularly liked was the Two Guns photo. It's now a ghost town in Arizona, near Meteor Crater. It's on our Route 66 bucket list and I hope we get there. This car, to me, is the icon of the 1930s Route 66 Traveler. Although in 1930, I imagine it looked a lot nicer. And I kicked myself for not taking a note on the model, but I'm guessing the blue around the radiator logo and the flying quell on the radiator cap, it's probably a Ford Coupe. If you know, leave me a comment. The museum is well thought out. It progresses through decades as you walk through, and there are murals of old newspaper and other clippings from each decade. Look at the polio vaccine poster from the late 50s. Seems the vaccine tasted good, worked fast, and I guess more importantly, it prevented polio. Periscope Films, YouTube, they have a lot of archived films, some from the peak of the polio epidemic from the late 1940s. It's worth watching, a lot of parallels for today. In 1948, the week of September 18th, recorded its highest polio incidence with 1,839 cases. But the incidence of 1949 already represents an increase over 1948 of 83%. To what figure this, the worst polio epidemic in history, will take us, we do not know. The estimate closed the gates on normal childhood. It has swept our beaches, stilled our boats, and emptied our parks. With the entertainment centers of Muncie, Indiana closed, its residents set out for the neighboring city of Anderson for relaxation. But infantile paralysis had spread such terror that the city of Anderson threw up a roadblock in an all-out effort to discourage polio's invasion. The invasion was nationwide, striking and spreading over every... Never underestimate the power or usefulness of fear, either of a virus or little green men. And the 1950s, if anything, was the era of little green men. Jill spotted this antique phone booth. It's funny to see something that I used every day growing up as an antique. <laughs> and I guess Route 66 could not be complete without the hippies. They got their name because they were hip or in the know of what was really going on about life. Not very different from the college kids of the day, I guess. Yoga poses at sunset or with a goat. Womb workshops for women. Do you get an owner's manual with that? I don't know. Or just veganism and naked retreats with free love. I guess the only thing that's really changed there is that now they want the tuition free too. And talk about bringing back some memories. Man, look at what I found. It's a Rambler. Not a joke. My first car was a Rambler. I paid $100 used for it in the late 1970s. AM radio only, no power anything, but the front seats did lay down flat. Funny that in the 1960s, the Rambler was viewed as a luxury car. This car had AC as standard when it was new, something that only Rolls-Royce did at the time. I wish I still had that car.
Today, it's global warming. In the 1970s, it was the Ice Age. <laughs> Al Gore in 2009 said something like the North Pole was going to lose most of its ice by 2013. About that. In the 1960s, it was worldwide famine by 1975, and in 1970, all of the rivers in the U.S. would be boiled dry. Between the hippies and the politicians, it's a miracle, I guess, that I've made it 20 years into the 21st century. I hope this carbon tax saves us all. Okay, you can call me a nerd, but I found this chunk of concrete interesting. The first stages of Route 66's construction started with Portland concrete, which is basically just Portland cement mixed with gravels. This was revolutionary, though, for the 1920s, as most roads of that era, they were still either dirt or crushed gravel, or dirt mixed with the crude oil. Maybe some cities and towns, perhaps, used bricks. But the problem was during 1917 World War I, the railroads could not keep up with cargo demands, and trucks began hitting the roads to make critical deliveries. Route 66 was one of the very first modern roads of any length in the United States. In closing, I have this perspicacious old friend who has some degree of knowledge of everything, it seems. We used to work together, but now both retired, and we don't get together as often as we should. Anyway, his initials were BB, and somewhere along the way, he gained the nickname B Square. When I saw this sign, it reminded me of him. Barry, here's your sign. Well, guys, that's about all we can share with you from the Route 66 Museum in Clinton, Oklahoma. We give it a thumbs up. From here, we're taking some of the old Route 66 over to McLean, Texas. See you there.